All right, guys. Um, I'm Nick Matei. I work here at NRL, mostly with Toby. Most of you all know that, so I'll keep it relatively informal. So I have like 105 slides today, which is probably way too many. So I'm going to speed through uh, many of them because I didn't know who all was going to be here and what all I needed to include. Um, so I want to talk mostly about uh, two projects that we've been working on, um, some of which most of the people here have either been involved in or heard me talk about previously. Uh, so this is a combination of two talks um, that I gave while I was in the US for a little while, and it's mostly going to be centered around uh, our work with Preflib, which is our whole idea of uh, aggregating a lot of extra data for uh, uh, researching preferences. And that will be presented at uh, Algorithmic Decision Theory here in about a month. And also, I'll talk a little bit about our paper on a randomized tiebreaking, which appeared at uh, AAAI earlier this year. Um, there's also about a two-second delay between touching the button and getting a slide, so we'll see how this Try to get this timed out right. So in general, we're in uh, talking about social choice. Uh, remember that uh, when we talk about social choice, what we're really talking about is there's, or computational social choice specifically, there's this whole big literature on social choice, which has existed in pol political science and economics, and there's this whole big literature on multi-agent systems here in, in computer science, and it's all about sort of this two-way flow between how can we use ideas from social choice about how agents interact, about how you reach these group decisions, how can we apply those ideas into uh, areas of, you know, multi-agent system areas in computer science. Likewise, how can we take uh, some of the stuff that we're doing in computer science and sort of apply it to uh, what, we're, what happens in, in these, uh, uh, these social choice settings. I'm going to talk mostly about uh, what computer science can do for, for social choice uh, in the talk today. Uh, and again, a lot of this really centers around uh, preference aggregation. So how do we as a society or as a group of agents get together? How do we make a dis group decision or maybe a group recommendation? A lot of times we'll have preferences which are individually rational but maybe not group rational. Um, or we have noisy data, or what happens a lot here, we have people who don't know what they want, don't know what they like, uh, stuff like that. I'm not going to get through these slides because it takes three seconds to change the slides. Um, so again, we're talking mostly about voting and ranking. Uh, specifically, you know, this is one of the areas where these social choice ideas can really come into to computer science because we have these large volumes of noisy data. Um, and so how do, we, how do we sort of turn all this data into sort of like this actionable stuff, these, these decisions, um, in sort of a meaningfully principled way? Um, and how do we do this quickly at web scale and with lots of data? And how do we sort of understand all of this stuff that's going on? And this is sort of the idea uh, behind what's happening, right? And this is happens uh, if you look at sort of search engines, right? They're sort of doing this online optimization thing where they're looking at lots of different inputs, especially now. You know, I think, was it Google? Google, your, your search in Google is like 20 to 30 different points that they keep on you. There's no such thing as a generic Google ranking anymore. Like, they look at your cookies. They look at your history. They're taking all of this uh, information about your preferences that they keep and using that to tailor the preference order that they're going to show you. And so we're in this whole thing where we're taking all kinds of disjoint and, and maybe dissimilar data and trying to to create these overall recommendations. Um, and this, again, also has wider applications to uh, things that optimization people are more interested in, like what's the new thing we're talking about? Uh, looking at resource distribution for these food bank charities, um, how to allocate uh, uh, food to lots of different charities, and you have a routing problem wrapped up with an aggregation problem wrapped up with a fair division problem. And so how do you, how do you sort of uh, get all this stuff together? Um, but today, I'm mostly going to talk about voting, uh, because voting is, is fun. So in general, we're going to have a set of candidates, which I'll call C. Uh, this set will have size M. Uh, we're going to have a set of voters, which is the set V. And uh, it'll have uh, size N. And I'll talk more about like the representation of the votes themselves, because that's one of the big things uh, that I want to talk about today, um, specifically related to the data that we're getting. Uh, also, we have as a voting rule or voting correspondence. So a voting rule returns us a singleton, so one single winner, like Tony Abbott. And a voting correspondence is not necessarily going to give us a single result. It could give us a set of results, right? So a, a set of co-winners, which I don't know. I have a good example for that one from recent memory. Uh, so the voting rule takes the preferences 
uh, and aggregates them into some total group order. So my sort of canonical example that I use when I talk to, to, to people is, is food because, and believe it or not, I like to eat a lot. So we, <laughs> we're going to talk about ordering like a giant pizza. And so we have these big pizzas, I think in the US, I haven't seen them here. These like 28 inch pizzas that are like this big. Um, no, they're awesome. Uh, but you, you can really only get like a couple of toppings. So now we have this problem where we all have different preferences over what we want on the pizza, but we, we have to pick sort of one. Um, so there's all these different sort of uh, ideas, voting rules, and axioms, things that, that, that we want to follow when we make these group decisions. And one of these is the Condorcet criteria, which says that uh, if there is some option that is better than all the other options, then it should win. And so this is sort of representing this, this uh, pairwise idea. Like if pepperoni is always ranked ahead of sausage, if a majority of people pr prefer pepperoni to sausage, then we should probably take pepperoni before we take sausage. So if we've got these votes uh, down here in the bottom, you know, two people are pepperoni, sausage, cheese, and then veggie. Veggie does very low poorly on this profile, I think. Uh, we can, we can take these votes and we can look at all the sort of the pairwise matchups. But the problem is, and this is sort of what's called the Condorcet cycle or, or the violations of this, uh, this, this Condorcet paradox, is that you can get these situations where a majority of people prefer one item to another, a majority of people prefer sausage to veggie here, and a majority of people prefer veggies to pepperonis. So now you have like this cycle where everything is majority preferred to everything else. And this is the Condorcet paradox, right? You get these weird, uh, situations where individually rational preferences are not group rational. And that leads to all these sorts of problems. So independent of the Condorcet criteria, which doesn't look like a very good voting rule, uh, you can kind of encode different ways to score these or do tie breaking. So one thing that's really common uh, is this idea of Copeland scoring, right? Which is what happens when you have, uh, I think soccer tournaments are really one of the more common examples. You look at each sort of pairwise matchup and you award a point or some number of points uh, to a win, you award some number of points to a tie, and you award some negative points generally to a loss. So taking the same preferences over the same uh, pizza toppings, you know, you can break the same thing down and we're gonna, we're gonna set points uh, for each of those pairwise matchups that we had in the last graph. And if we do that, we end up with uh, a tie. So we end up with kind of a voting correspondence here. So here we would have to apply some tie-breaking rule in order to select uh, whether or not we're getting a cheese pizza or a sausage pizza. And I'll talk more about uh, tie-breaking rules a little bit later on uh, in the talk. And so then there's these others, there's a bunch of other voting rules. You have plurality, which is very sort of common. We select the top leader. Uh, we get one result for plurality. You have veto, where you're just telling me what you don't like. Uh, if you aggregate the same set of preferences with veto, you get, come on, buddy. I know you want to, a different answer. Uh, and there's also the idea of sort of a board account where you award points based off a of position in a list. So the top position in your ranking gets more points than the bottom position in your ranking, which seems to make a lot of you know, sense. But if you do that again with the same profile, you actually end up with the third answer. I spent a lot of time constructing this profile so that it does come up with a different answer for every one. But it, you end up in this situation where you're like, well, what should we really do? Because it, depe you know, it depends on what kind of information you're going to have and what kind of uh, setting of be in and, and how do you sort of principally decide these voting rules. So one thread of research that happens is, well, let's sort of axiomatize, axiomatize them. Can't say that word. Uh, so come up with these properties that we want to keep. And that's sort of a theoretical way to do it. And then, because I'm more of an engineer, I want to like test these things and see when you actually run into these problems. Because we can have these theoretical problems that really don't occur in practice. And when I wanted to start checking into this, it's like, well, there's no data. So where do we get data? And also, how do we parameterize this data and things like that? Um, and why don't we have any data as sort of a community in, in preference handling? And so this has been an ongoing project with Toby for about the last uh, year to go through and try to find uh, a bunch of data and, and really look at uh, assembling this as a resource for the community. I'm going to talk briefly about a separate project which is really close to this, uh, which I did with uh, two psychologists from the University of Illinois, um, which is more about how the data that you have might not be as good as the data you think you have. So it's about uncertainty in the data, even with uh, something as simple as, you know, what is your favorite pizza? 
So I'll talk about that first, and then we'll talk about uh, organizing all this data uh, with, with Toby. Um, in terms of one of the things that we thought about was, well, there's all these expressions of preference in all this data that we, that we have, but we just have to organize it. Um, because it turns out that there's not a lot of like really freely available data. Uh, there is, but it's all in different formats. It's all over the web. You, you can't do anything with it. So, so one of the things I did a while ago was, well, let's take this uh, Netflix data, right? This is ratings of movies, um, and turn this into votes and see what happens, right? Because these ratings of these movies, these large web databases actually tell us a lot about uh, what you would rather watch and what you would prefer. Um, and also, this is more what uh, computer science can do for uh, social choice is because we have access to these big databases, right? We keep all this stuff, we do all this crap, but we don't actually like use it out um, for more of the these principled reasonings. We just kind of like take an average over, not so much anymore, but you know, ten years ago, we just take an average over it and say, oh, this will work. So what we did was we took the Netflix database, which was published for uh, a separate competition uh, in knowledge discovery and data mining about eight years ago, uh, and it's like a hundred, it's a hundred million ratings from uh, about half a million users over a corpus of like 18,000 items. And it's just these numbers, right? It's one to five stars. It's how much you like this thing. And so what we did was we kind of went through and said, well, since the numbers are only one to five, let's just pick a random subset of these items, right? So we'll take three movies like The Godfather, Monty Python, and Jaws. And if you have a strict rating for each one of these, then I can turn that into a strict ranking, right? I can say, all right, well, you gave uh, Godfather a five, you gave Monty Python a four, and Jaws a three. So you obviously have some ordinal preference over these items. Uh, and one of the good things about this data, which the psychology people actually agreed with me for a little while, uh, was that this is better than some of these data sets that you get where there's just random surveys. Like I went out, I asked 40 undergraduates what they, to rank these eight items. I didn't incentivize them. These 40 undergraduates do not care about talking to me. They don't care about telling me anything useful. They're just filling out random uh, sheets of paper in order to get you know, the free piece of pizza or something, I promise them. Whereas here, with the Netflix data, you actually have users that are incentivized to be sincere. Because if you tell Netflix a bunch of lies about what movies you like, then Netflix is going to start spamming your, your page when you log in with a bunch of crappy movies. And you have to like get around it. So you, you really, um, this data is properly incentivized, as they call it in the mathematical psychology field. I found out. I didn't know this. So we, we did this. Um, we generated you know, hundreds of millions, orders of magnitude more sort of uh, strict preference profile settings than have been studied. And we looked at, we asked all sort of, sorts of questions about you know, when do voting rules fall apart? How often do we have these cycles? How often do we have all these, these strange problems? Uh, the one thing we found in this was that uh, we actually don't get these, these cycle frequencies. So this part where we have a majority preferring A to B, a majority preferring B to C and a majority preferring C to A, turns out that happens like less than half a percent of the time across sort of multiple cuttings and splittings of this data set. And it was kind of invariant to uh, taking movies that were very closely ranked together, taking movies that were very closely ranked apart, things like that. So we can kind of say, you know, this doesn't really occur with this data set. Uh, we also got a really high overlap between voting rules. Uh, we have this high incidence of what's called conversa efficiency. Harris. What are these sets? These, these sets? sets? Yeah, these sets. These sets are random three set, four set, and five set draws of movies. So I have 17,000 objects. I know I have numerical ratings of each one of these objects. So I take random combinations uh, of five movies, up to five movies at a time, and I try to extract ordinal, uh, strict ordinal preference over those five movies. I'm going to get into why this is probably not the best procedure uh, in a minute. So, yeah, just completely at random. And then also, we did it, uh, and I'll talk about this in a second, um, not necessarily across classifications, but movies that are rated tightly or rated far apart. Um, and so we get this. Uh, high rates of this conversation efficiency, we get all these nice properties that shake out of this, but there's kind of, in retrospect, there should have been some like red flags about some of the process that I was doing. Um, what we ended up doing, or what I ended up doing actually, was it when you do this, you are sort of 
inserting information into the data that you don't necessarily know is there. And at the same time, uh, the procedure also sort of tossed out anything that wasn't a strict ranking. So if you rated Jaws and The Godfather both a four, I actually discarded your rating because I don't know that you have a strict ranking over the, over the, over the elements. And so what you end up doing when you do this is you end up selecting for uh, very strongly preferred sets. Because now what I've done is I've inadvertently called the whole database and taken out the ones that uh, are maybe very tightly clustered. Right? The only ones that sort of came out are the ones where I can really sort of naturally take this five point scale and turn it into an effective sort of ordinal uh, ranking of these items. So maybe that wasn't the best idea. <laughs> so, but, but how bad could that really be? And that's the kind of the question that, I, that we came to after that is, so, and this is, this is this data transform, what I did is not unheard of. It's not like I pulled this out of thin air. Like this is stuff people actually do. This gets done uh, in a lot of settings to simplify data or to, to, to make uh, sort of scale up some of these, these data recommendation engines. And so it's not like, oh, Nick made a mistake. This is like, well, this was something that people actually kind of do to transform their data. But it seems like it might have given us bad conclusions in a social choice sort of setting. Like, what did we, what did we sort of unintentionally introduce? Um, and so this was the part where we started going through and we said, well, what kind of data do you actually get? You, you want this, right? All of social choice research, not all, but like 85% of it, is based off the idea that you can get this. You can get a strict ordinal rating, ranking, excuse me, of a set of items. And that's not what you get almost ever. And what you get is you get these settings where uh, people have these partial, uh, partial rankings where, well, I really like Transformers because I don't have taste in movies. And then these three movies are kind of okay, and that one's that one's terrible. So I'll put that at the end. You know, you you, you don't get these neat, strict, strict settings. And what you get in the web, and what is really not dealt with in, in social choice a lot, is you get these incomplete settings, right? I didn't watch this movie, so I actually don't have any information about where it sits in this corpus of of, of data. And at first, and and a lot of times in computer science and social choice, you, you make this assumption that this unranked, unseen item is, is it's, it's tied and it's at the end, it's bad, right? I'm just gonna go ahead and assume it's bad. And I was actually giving this talk and I, and I realized that that's probably not, the, that's not even a valid assumption in every domain, right? The reason that I haven't been to, uh, what, what's the nice restaurant downtown, Quay, is not because I know it's bad, right? I haven't been to Quay because I can't afford it. Like, it's probably the best restaurant in Sydney. But and it probably goes at the head of this list. No, there's Mark and Quay, right? There's two different, there's two different ones. Um, they probably both go at the head of the list, but I can't afford to go there, so I don't know where they go in this list. And if I make this sort of blithe assumption, blithe domain independent assumption that anything that's not seen goes at the bottom of this bottom of this thing, then I'm losing even more information, right? I'm, I'm doing stuff that I shouldn't be doing. Uh, <laughs> See, there's some domains where you can make these, uh, you can make these these assumptions, and this idea that the data that's coming in is really not all that 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 well structured extends across. If you go through some of the social the social choice papers, and these have been published over the last like 10 or 12 years, actually longer than that, um, and the computer science papers, everybody uses these data sets, which are. And they throw, they do the same thing I did. They throw data out. So this Irish election data set where um, people use these to, this is an actual election from Ireland from about eight years ago, six years ago. And people use these to test rating and ranking procedures. What they don't tell you a lot of the times is what they actually do is this data set is about 85% incomplete. And what I mean by that is people say, oh, it's a strict ranking. If I go through and eliminate all the votes that are not sort of complete rankings of all the items, it turns out when you do that, you're keeping 5% of the data from one of the, one of the two data sets, and you're keeping 12% from the other one. And this, this continues on and on. There's APA data, which has probably got at least 15 to 20 papers published based off of this, where only 65%, or I'm sorry, 35% of the data is, gets used. You throw out these massive volumes of data. And so I did the same thing, but I'm willing to admit that I'm an idiot. And this, this stuff is all as questionably collected 
and is questionably trimmed. Um, but nobody really stops and thinks about it. It's like, oh, well, we're, we might be basing these assumptions and these conclusions off of data that is just you know, kind of garbage. Um, so what we wanted to do is kind of highlight why these assumptions can lead to sort of bad things. And we use this kind of uh, generalization of voting rules, which allows you to apply just for binary relations. So I want to only look at um, the information that I actually have. I know if one movie is rated ahead of another, I know if one movie is rated equal to another. And so you can actually generalize the voting rules to kind of work in these settings. Um, and then we want to look at what happens where we take the data that we actually have and we try these different sort of extension methods and see how much it can change sort of the, our conclusions or our results. So we do this for uh, two, actually three sets of specifically five movies. Um, this is about adapting the voting rules. I'm going to skip through this, but trust me, you can do it. This is a thing. People do it. Uh, so the, the extension models that we want to use is, first of all, this idea that you, you don't imbue, you don't add any information you don't have. This is sort of the agnostic model is what we call it. Is you, just, you only look at the, the relations that you have. Either that two items are equivalent, one is ahead of the other, or vice versa. Right? Um, Another model that, and this is the one that like, my, my whole idea with, with Mark and Quay, is that we, we take any, any unseen item and we just push it to the bottom. And we say, all right, this, it's unseen because um, in this domain especially, this might actually be valid. You don't watch movies that you think you're probably not going to like. Right? So it's kind of sometimes safe to assume you're not watching it because, because it's probably terrible. Uh, and also, and the third model is this idea of this sort of adjustment anchor. Uh, idea, where we assign the user median ranking to an item. So if Hannah's watched 100 movies and her median across 100 movies is a 3, any unseen movie, we just assume Hannah gives a 3 until she tells us sort of otherwise. We assume that she's always going to rank near her average or near her median unless she sort of pushes it one way or the other. And so we, we tried out these three different models, which sort of uh, put in a different amount of uh, information. We also ran this sort of inference uh, procedure. This is from the psychology guys. This is how they do their thing, um, which is about redrawing from the election set. And it gives you an idea of how stable your results are with respect to sort of this random noise, this random permutations. And so when you do this, you get this notion of reliability, so how confident you can be in what you're saying uh, in terms of the rates or the frequency of occurrence. And it turns out that when you do this, Oh, right. Um, we, we drew sort of one set where we just kind of took five movies randomly. And actually, this was a set that was in the uh, original data set. And the reason why it sticks around is we just wanted to see. But this is the kind of stuff you could pull out, you would end up pulling out where uh, there's one movie that is, has very few ratings, but is very, very highly rated. There's one movie that everyone's seen. And there's a couple movies that like no one's seen and actually has fairly poor ratings. Um, and these are the kind of sets you sort of ended up getting uh, in the sort of the mass scattergun approach we used, um, because these kind of have a strong preference uh, structure across them. And really, honestly, not many people have kind of seen all three of these movies, uh, and you run into some problems with that. The other thing that we did was, and this is why the Netflix data is cool, is we went through and we actually found uh, five movies that are relatively similar genres, with the exception of Buena Vista Social Club, which is a documentary. Um, but they have almost exactly the same number of people who have seen them, and they have almost exactly the same average and the same median across those. So you can actually get this really tightly packed uh, set of items. Um, because there's just so many, you can go through and, and sort of really closely pick out the, the kind of data that you want to get. Uh, we, obviously, a lot more people kind of look at this. I'm going to kind of go through these a little quickly because I'm taking way too long today. And, and what we end up doing uh, is, is running these bootstrap replicabilities. And in, in some of the sets, you get the result that you think you're going to get, which is that by adding more information, by, by applying sort of this pessimistic uh, extension or this anchor and adjust extension, we get a much more reliable result right, out, of the, out of the sets, out of the, res, uh, the kind of orders that we get from the different voting rules and things like that. Uh, it turns out that for other sets, you actually get the opposite result. By adding more information, you actually decrease the reliability of the, uh, the result that you, or the, uh, the ensuing sort of social order. And so you, and, and this kind of goes on and on. We demonstrate this through the paper with a couple of different examples where 
you know, at one point, if you don't assume any extra information, you get a very stable uh, set of responses out of the voting rules. But when you add information, you start seeing that one voting rule's top element might be another voting rule's bottom element. And you can get all these kind of really weird uh, artifacts from just uh, adding more information. And so the sort of the idea that of all of this and what I want to talk about, the, the motivation from all this is if you can do this with kind of any individual small set of data, we need to start really paying attention to um, where the data was collected, why the data was collected, how the data was collected, and, and sort of the reliability of this data. And But that that's almost too far down the road in that we want to go back and say, well, where does all of this data come from? And so that kind of starts into the work with what we've been doing with Preflib is um, now we got to actually get data together, right? Because there's not any sort of one corpus of this. And we got to put it all in one place. So then we can start asking these like meaningful questions about why and how we can use this data. And this was a project that Toby and I have been working on for a little while. I think some of you have probably heard me talk about it before. This is not unprecedented, especially in these large communities where the machine learning repository, which is actually something that's very community-based uh, over in machine learning, has, I think, a couple hundred thousand different data sets in it. People actively sort of participate uh, in these communities. And, and sort of the question is, well, why don't we, as sort of knowledge representation and reasoning, have, or preference handling, have these, these large databases? We don't even have these tools, right? Well, Kia is this great, kind of great plug and chug data mining thing that people get. Uh, it's sort of an outreach tool at this point. Um, my wife's in uh, ecology, which is a place where they don't really, they like look at animals. They don't really do uh, a lot of uh, modeling and, and data. But when she was in graduate school, she had people that would come to me once they found out I was a computer person, it's terrible, uh, and ask me about, you know, how do you use data mining in these, you know, is there a library that we can just go get these data mining things from? Like, do data mining stuff, right? So it's, it's not only good as a community to help develop the community, it's good as for, a, for a research community in order to sort of push out tools into other places where they can have impact. Um, there's a variety of challenges that are kind of associated with trying to put together the library like this, especially at the beginning. Um, you know, just getting enough data to make it useful for anyone. No one's going to come if you don't have anything that they want to use. Uh, one thing that uh, is a big sort of community issue over in machine learning is they think that, or there's people that think that, you know, maybe having one big repository is not so good because we're actually driving uh, a lot of the research into these problems that are hard in that exists in the, rep in the repository. And that's this idea of overfitting, right? We're really focused on the problem instances that are hard that are in the repository, and we're not really paying attention to a larger uh, set of problems that exist out there. Um, so that can be a little trade-off there. Uh, one thing we run into in, in preference handling, too, is this idea of sort of privacy and information silos, right? One of the big ones uh, where we actually do have some fake data, some synthetic data, uh, but we can't get any real data is this this kidney matching market that happens in the US now where we have all this we're trying to do a big matching market and uh, with people who need kidney donations and people who have kidneys to donate but you can't really touch any of this data because it's all protected by HIPAA and you can't you know medically disclose this stuff so you get these these places where you can really have an impact but you can't actually distribute the data because people will get mad well, understandably so but it is sort of a barrier to to really building up uh, a useful, uh, useful library for people. So we actually have this. It's up. It's going. Uh, it's a website, and we've been sort of adding to it since I think about May of this year. Uh, we've started to get a lot of response from people in the community. We've started getting donations of data. Um, things have been going pretty well. Uh, there's sort of four. Oh, I think I might have cut out a thing. Uh, there's four sort of broad categories of data. I thought I had. There we go. All right. So <laughs> uh, Google Google Analytics is kind of cool. So since uh, May 1st, we've had almost 500 visitors, which is almost 270 visitors. Uh, people are spending about four minutes on the site. You know, you can see how many new visitors and things like that. Uh, engagement's okay. Obviously, some of these are like fake robots that are just crawling the site, but you actually do see um, a fairly decent number of, of downloads and, and sort of the uh, bounce rate is in relatively engaging. You can also overlay this by country so we can find out where people are coming from. Like Google Analytics is so cool. Uh, 
So all the blue, there's an intensity of blue. I don't know if you guys can see it. That's how many visits from those particular countries. I don't know who visited from South Africa. It's kind of strange. Um, have a fair number of new visitors. A lot of it's uh, direct web traffic. Um, I don't have that graph. And I think we are the number one hit for Toby Walsh preference data, like as a Google search query. So uh, apparently a lot of our traffic comes from that Google search specifically. Uh, <laughs> So, and uh, yeah, this, is, this should actually be about 100 data sets. Um, I actually track when people download individual things, so I can tell you what data sets are actually getting download, downloaded as they go. I'm watching everyone. Um, so we, we break the data down into four large categories. Uh, the first one is uh, election data, so generally we want this sort of strict rank order uh, information that, uh, that all the, that's all, and it's all its mathematical niceties. Um, but we also have a lot of stuff where we have incomplete partial orders, so we, we have ties between, say, some sequence of elements. Um, we have elements that are missing, things like that. The actual, the, the, the uh, I'll get to this in a second. The, the most interesting thing that I've found is, I, I just got this big data dump of Australian uh, election returns from a couple of years ago, the other day I need to go through. Oops, we went too far, go back. So this is the data sources we have. We have about 470 instances right now. Um, the, the funny thing that I've been noticing is, so all these places that have gone to these like full range preference voting deal, right here in Australia, you have to rate, you have to number every candidate, like one, two, somebody told me the Senate ballot in Queensland had like 118 senators or 104. And you have to number them all. Um, if you look at the Scottish data, the Irish data, and the Australian data, people are really lazy. Um, so it, it, the whole argument in the U.S. is, oh, all we get to do is just pick one or pick the other, and that really restricts what we can say. But if you look at the data that's actually coming in from these election returns, it's something like 60 to 70 percent of the, the ballots only rate one item. Like they just put the top item and they don't actually put any of the other ones. So I can pick between 14 candidates and actually write them all down, but less than 50 percent of the people actually bother to do that. They're just sticking the top item on there, so it's kind of funny. Um, but these are the kinds of things you can actually start to see when you uh, really start putting all this data. We all have one big unified format for all of this, so you can run through it, you can parse it, you can do all these kind of interesting experiments where, uh, this is just a kind of a basic one that we did um, that I'll go through fairly quickly. Uh, we want to look at, there's this, there's this notion that all preference orders are equally likely. Um, this, and this is a way that people generate data. I'll just randomly generate data from this model that says, uh, the data comes from a random variable where all total orders over the items are equally likely. It's called the impartial culture assumption. So we said, all right, well, we're up to almost 500 data sets. Let's just like average it all together and see if that models the random variable that we, you know, if that gives us the impartial culture. And so we, we kind of want to, for comparison's sake, we created two sort of distributions that are objectively kind of bad. Uh, the first one is... Uh, the probability for each observation is off by 50%. So I just sort of randomly permute the numbers in the, in the random variable to, to get this, this thing to happen. Also, I have this other one where we just sort of say that there's a probability zero of observing any 50% of the predictions. So I'll take some of the predictions and just throw them out. Even though they probably, they should exist, I just sort of take them out for no reason. Uh, just to kind of give you an idea of how, how, how the, the deltas really stack up. Um, and what we end up seeing is that uh, this is sort of the average Euclidean error from the impartial culture assumption. Uh, the blue dots along the top are the average of all of the uh, elements in preflib. And the green and the red are actually as we scale up across the number of candidates uh, for those two sort of objectively bad distributions. And kind of the takeaway from this is they're not very close at all, because like, the maximum of this is one, right? So we're, we're looking at, this is normalized, uh, a fairly, fairly decent sort of spread between the, this model that, that people are kind of assuming is useful uh, for predictive, predictive analysis and what we've gotten to right now on, you know, at, this, at this stage. And so we do this for the complete orders. Uh, the incomplete orders actually are a little bit closer. Uh, you end up, uh, this is the idea where you have elements that are unranked in the set. This is what I call an incomplete order. Um, those, those models actually end up being a little bit closer uh, because there's more observations. But 
We'll see what happens. I'm going to like, I should write a script that just continually updates these graphs like every time I add more data. Because at some, at some theoretical point, right, we should get enough data where it is just the average across all of it. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know if we'll ever get there. Um, again, this is by, this is across all the data sets. This is the average error uh, by given number of candidates. And this is the kind of thing that you can do once you, once you get all this data together. You know, I've never seen a graph that sort of says, all right, well, we're going to just slide the candidates up and down and, real, and use real data. You usually generate synthetic data in order to be able to do that kind of experiment. And we have enough data now that you can kind of do that um, with real data. And that's kind of the cool part, uh, one of the things that we wanted to do. Uh, so the other kinds of, nope, nope, still just more voting data sets. Uh, Toby had a, had a keynote talk that was based off of this, so there's actually a lot of, um, made him a lot of slides which are uh, really kind of show the, ver the diversity and variety of, of uh, voting data that we have because that seems to be something that's uh, fairly important in the, in the community. Uh, we also have combinatorial data, so where we have structure preferences that are structured in some meaningful way, usually with a graphical language of some kind. Um, we have also in, in this area, we have stuff from TripAdvisor and Yelp, so we have multi-attribute ratings. So you rate a hotel and TripAdvisor off of a variety of attributes um, before you give it a final rating. And so we actually have a couple of these sort of combinatorial data sets, um, which are really these multi-attribute rating sets. Again, one sort of uh, unified uh, format. Uh, we have this matching data. Right now we have the, some kid synthetic kidney donor matching data where um, we have a... Uh, fake data about these uh, kidney matching markets, which is a real big application area for some of the markets and matching. I've been emailing with the residency people in the US when they do, uh, people in medical school do residencies. And the people in medical school get to bid on the places they want to do their residencies, and the hospitals get to bid on the candidates they want. So it's a two-sided matching market, and so I'm trying to get uh, some data from that. But that actually gets studied relatively regularly, but there's not a lot of publicly uh, available data um, in an easy to use format. So we also don't have any uh, optimization data. Uh, I linked out to the Max CSP competition guys, uh, but they seem to change their format almost every year still for some reason. Um, or they tweak it a little bit, and I'm kind of hesitant to, to, to try to take, they told me I could take their data and post it, but I'm hesitant to try to, to really enforce a format on that. Um, because I think they're more established and I want them to be kind of part of that. So we want to kind of leverage these ideas uh, for these short-term interesting projects, maybe even some long-term projects, um, mostly about learning and modeling uh, preferences and also getting more, more data. So if you guys actually know anything, please let me know. Um, I need to get a tool suite up there because I've developed a whole chain of tools and I need to actually talk about or uh, get those posted, which haven't happened yet. So I have until the ADT, I have to go present this to other people outside of the organization. I should probably have the tools posted by then. That would be a good thing. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about, uh, probably pretty briefly, since you guys have been sitting here for so long, uh, is uh, some work with uh, Toby and Harris. I love this picture of Harris. And Serge and uh, Nina, which we had at uh, AAAI this year, which deals with uh, more kind of back toward voting, but very specifically about manipulation and voting systems. Um, again, you know, there's these three kind of ideas that attacks on voting systems that people look at. Uh, one is manipulation, where I cast an insincere ballot in order to try to obtain a better result. Uh, bribery, where I'm some sort of outside agent and I'm paying people in order to affect their result. Or control, where I'm sort of the central organizer and I have the ability to like kick people out of the election or add in new candidates or uh, disqualify voters and things like that. Uh, so we're going to talk about manipulation specifically, where we have some set of candidate, actually we're going to talk about one candidate, uh, who's trying to cast an insincere ballot uh, in order to uh, affect the election in positive just for him. So the reason why we do this is there's these seminal results of social choice that say, you know, you can't have uh, certain axiomatic properties uh, and, and sort of combine them in, in good ways to get these, these good voting rules, you know, every voting rule is actually provably manipulable um, if it meets a couple of different axioms. And so it's, uh, 
it's kind of this, this whole idea that, well, we can't really come up with really good voting rules because we're going to have to give up something. Right? We always have to give up a property, which seems very reasonable in isolation, but when we put them together, it's going to be bad. Um, and the reason why we study these is because the computer science sort of view of it is, is well, but if we can sort of make the bad behavior computationally hard to achieve, uh, then just like cryptography, we've kind of hidden the bad thing hard, you know, enough that you that will discourage it. Um, and that's the whole idea of why we look at the complexity of manipulation and the complexity of these questions in, uh, in these different voting rules. And so, I don't know what we're doing. Oh, this was for a general audience earlier, so I had to actually talk about like how complexity hierarchy works, assuming all you guys know this. Um, and so, again, there are a number of simplifying assumptions that we have access to uh, everyone's preferences and all this other stuff, which may or may not be valid uh, in, in real terms, which goes back to, to why I want to look at data. But again, what we want to talk about today is what do you do, what do you do when we have these ties, right? When, when cheese and sausage are tied and we got to like figure out what to do, can what we do with the tie breaking, how we sort of pick our tie breaking rule, uh, can that affect uh, the manipulation complexity uh, for these individual voting rules? And again, we're given a set of uh, voters, a profile, given a set of candidates. We have, we're assuming we're just getting a voting correspondence, right? So we're going to get back a possible, or a non-empty subset of the candidates, which are co-winners, and we need, or which are winners, and we want to pick exactly one of these uh, in order to be the single winner. So uh, we're going to deal with uh, sort of non-deterministic tie-breaking rules here, which are based off of some kind of randomization, and. Uh, so we asked the sort of the question, the main question is, can I cast a vote which increases the probability uh, that my preferred candidate wins, if I know what this tie-breaking rule is? And there's a number of uh, tie-breaking rules that get used in practice. Um, whoops, sorry. Again, voting correspondences, scoring rules. We already talked about this. Uh, we're going to look at a lot of sort of the regular uh, voting rules that, that get talked about. So tie-breaking rules that get regularly get used in practice are, well, we're just going to have an arbitrarily set order over the candidates, and we'll just pick, you know, a candidate. In the case of a tie, the lexicographic least uh, candidate wins, or the tallest candidate wins, which is my favorite. Or you can do what they do in France, and you say the oldest candidate wins. Like this, this actually, you do kind of set these rules down, and there are very a lot of examples of where you use this. This also gets used in sports, right? The first tiebreaker is goals scored away, or something like that. We just pick another number and we break the tie based off that. These are deterministic tie-breaking uh, methodologies. Uh, another one that gets, gets used is this kind of idea of a random candidate. So we have this set of co-winners, and we're going to uniformly at random just pick one of them. Because we figure the, all the co-winners are equally sort of distinguished, and we just need, we need one of them. Um, this actually gets done a lot uh, in the US. I know this is going to sound weird. I'm sure it gets done other places, but being from the US, I know this. Um, there's many sort of state and city constitutions and, and sort of election procedures which say that in the event of a tie, the candidates play a hand of poker. Or in the event of a tie, the candidates throw a dice or something like that. You do this kind of randomization procedure over the thing, and it's supposed to be a fair game of chance. Um, I think it's actually in the New Mexico state constitution uh, that the, the governor is elected this way uh, in the event of a tie. And they actually had to do this a while ago. Um, and so this, this has been studied fairly well in, uh, in computational social choice uh, from uh, Svetlana and Edith over the last few years. Uh, another way to do this instead um, of picking a candidate at random is pick a vote at random. And this is kind of the idea of how random dictator works, is we're just going to randomly pick someone, and we'll break ties based off the order that they have uh, put down. So we're just going to pick a random vote out of all the votes that we have. And this is actually a fairly unstudied tie-breaking procedure, but it's used a lot in practice. And it's used a lot by uh, hippie open source organizations because it's embedded in the Schulze rule uh, as their official tie-breaking procedure. And the reason is is because it's, it's sort of more responsive uh, in general. It's immune to clones, which is a very technical thing that I'm not going to talk about today. And it also has this very obvious disincentive for reporting. 
When I run an election and I say, hey, if there's a tie, I might pick your vote, and that will be the tie-breaking procedure, you start to think about, well, maybe I should just put down my honest vote, right? You have this sort of natural sort of line that you can use with people to try to like shame them into doing the right thing. Uh, but we want to talk about computers, so they don't necessarily always have shame. Um, and some people have asked me, you know, is random vote really different from random candidate? And I like to illustrate with this example, which is uh, when Liz and I argue about what candy we're going to sneak into a movie. Um, so we have a set of candies that we're going to pick from, Tim Tams, M&Ms, Reese's Pieces, which I miss dearly, and we cannot get in Australia for some reason, except for at the weird bodega down the street, and uh, Twizzlers. And so we always have this argument because I like Reese's Pieces. They're the greatest candy ever made. And my wife likes Twizzlers. Uh, they're the worst thing ever, but whatever. So we have these two votes, right? It's always two of us because we're always arguing um, about, about what candy we're going to sneak in. And so, yeah, just get two candies. Well, you know. This is a better example when I was in graduate school and I can be like, I can't afford two candies. No. Um, <laughs> you're, you're eliminating the problem. I'm sorry. You got to let me, you got to let me have a problem. <laughs> no, I know, I know. Um, so, so if we do border scoring based off the two, uh, the two profiles I showed you up there at the top, uh, we have a three-way tie. M&Ms, Twizzlers, and Reese's are all, are all tied uh, in this ordering. And if we do random candidate each, you know, we're going to just randomly pick one of these three things. We'll go into the grocery store and just sort of pick it out of the bag. Uh, M&Ms actually have a chance to win here, so we have a one-third chance across all of them. But if you look at the random vote, M&Ms actually have no chance to win because no one ranked M&Ms first. Right? Neither one of us really like M&Ms. We're just kind of putting them on there. It's like, well, if I can't have my top, I guess we'll deal with M&Ms. And so the, this idea, this is kind of the idea of responsiveness, right? No one actually put M&Ms at the top, so why the heck should M&Ms end up at the top? And you could get in this egalitarian argument where you can say, well, but M&Ms are the compromise candidate. You know, it's, Everybody's like kind of happy with M&Ms. So that's a whole other discussion. But in general, this, is, you can, this sort of illustrates the difference between the two. Uh, procedures that they do kind of give different probability distributions for the same uh, same input. And you can also show that these two problems are uh, unrelated computationally. You can demonstrate voting rules where it's MP complete uh, for manipulation in one and uh, polynomial time for the other one and vice versa. So you can actually show these voting rules uh, that go in, in the same direction. The big result from this paper that we that I think is, is really useful is the fact that Borda actually goes from being polynomial time manipulable for a single voter to being MP complete for a single voter just by switching the tie-breaking rule. So if we go to this random vote tie-breaking rule, you've actually increased the complexity of manipulation for this problem, which is kind of cool, right? Because that's the whole idea. That's what we're trying to get to uh, with this kind of stock and, and looking at all this stuff. And you can also show... Uh, I'm not going to go through details today, uh, that, that what's called K approval, where we have some number of uh, candidates that we're allowed to approve of, moves into uh, MP complete uh, for the single manipulator problem as well. And so we went through and looked at a whole host of, of these voting rules. And there's, I think, a number. Yeah. So all the green ones actually move, right? We've kind of moved all of these over into the MP hard category. Uh, just by changing the voting rule. So it's a very small tweak, which actually achieves kind of this one uh, computational social choice idea is that we've made it harder to manipulate, right? This is something that we're trying to do. And I really did kind of like doing this work because we actually came up with some kind of cool results that we actually have a proscriptive message uh, out of this, which is like, just use random vote tie-breaking. Like, it makes stuff harder. It's good. Um, and that's, that's, uh, that was, that's sort of our big result uh, from this paper. We also did some uh, computer simulations because I was around and looked at sort of the different tie-breaking rules and a number of different sort of statistical cultures. Uh, the reason, before anyone asks, that we didn't do these experiments on actual data from PrefLib is I hadn't done the PrefLib stuff before I did the experiments here. I got that question at AAA. It's a little weird. Um, and so we look at a, a sweeping of a couple of parameters for number of candidates, number of voters, and we want to look at different kind of questions, like how often do we actually have to apply tie-breaking rules, and 
uh, does this tie-breaking rule actually matter? And so the unfortunate thing is that uh, across over 500,000 sort of experiments that we ran under these statistical cultures, we actually get like sort of a less than two to three percent possibility that they'll end up in a tie. Of those two to three percent that end up in a tie, it turns out that the polynomial time algorithm for random candidate uh, manipulation is this is the best vote 98% um, of the time. So it's actually a very good approximation of what you should be doing. Um, we only sort of failed, like complexity only sort of came up and obviously blew up the algorithm uh, seven times after out of these half a million instances or so. Um, so it, unfortunately, you can say something like, well, this makes it computationally hard, but when we run this big sweeping of, of experiments, we don't actually see that complexity really come up a lot as a, as a real computational barrier. Uh, the one thing you do get, though, is that the um, probability of the top element coming out, this is the responsiveness issue that I was talking about before, uh, is a little bit higher uh, for the random vote. So you actually see that random vote is a little bit uh, more responsive to the individual preferences of the uh, uh, of the electorate, um, so the top preferences of the voters themselves. So I think that's all I got, maybe. Yeah, so again, using the NICTA coloring scheme, the tie-breaking random vote can make manipulation intractable in some very closely contested elections. And it's, it's one of those things where it can help, it's not going to hurt, and it's probably better to to use it because it sort of puts you on the safe side, even though it's something that's really not going to come up in a, in a large percentage of, 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 of situations. Should do some kind of like weighted. No, you have to use the votes. I was going to, I'm sorry, that's a whole other thing. Um, so anyway, that's, oh, this is my last slide. There's lots of broader impacts for computational social choice. This is a lot of the stuff that uh, I've been working on in the last uh, year or so uh, across a couple of different sort of application domains within uh, social choice, and I think social choice is very cool. And next year we have uh, Comsoc, which is the big uh, workshop uh, for our area uh, coming up, which happens every two years, which is very fun. And I think that's it. No, thanks for everybody who worked on these different projects. Sorry, I forgot about that. Uh, <laughs> and you know, you guys know most of these people. Mike and Anna are nice, but that's it. Yay. <laughs> And, and one of the slides that I kind of breezed through there, uh, there was a really interesting article I read a while back about, I guess it was YouTube, used to have the five point system. And they went through and they would always sort of say, I forget what they were doing, they were doing some sort of data extension with their five point system. And actually by eliminating the five point system and going to just the thumbs up, thumbs down, they improved their rankings. They improved like sort of the reported satisfaction with the suggestions they were making because in their sort of the way that they were handling their data, they were kind of, uh, they were extending the, uh, the point rankings into these strict rankings and they were doing something very similar to what I was kind of trying to talk about is that you can, you, it actually gets to the point where you make these assumptions and you, you end up sort of walking down a really bad path and you don't catch it for a long time. But again, that, that's sort of a control thing, right? Is if I want to complete all the votes in such a way to get a result, that might be an issue. Yeah. Well, my experience of real life data is that they are extremely hairy. Yeah. And you have to do the mean yeah. to keep the sample size. No. And you get this page when people submit that. Yeah. Right? So, it was reviewed. So, actually, I review all the data. You go through every single thing and you have your criteria, like what, what you keep, what you throw away. So, I actually, I've gone back, I, I went through, somebody sent me some data and I asked them how they had cleaned it and they didn't sort of have a good explanation of it. And I said, well, do you have the uncleaned version of the data? Because in my mind, what you really want to be posting is 
you want to be posting sort of the most raw format. And then if you do some cleaning, you want to be very explicit about the steps you've taken. So you, I want it to be hairy, and then I want to have an auditable chain of the things that I've done. Right? Because in, in my mind, I'm OK with people trying different things, and the data has been cleaned. But it needs to be very clear sort of where this came from and how it was, the procedure with it was collected. So it's the idea that you can't isolate the data from the domain that it sort of exists in. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what I mean by as long as it's sort of auditable. And I actually didn't take a set from somebody because they said, oh, we cleaned it. And I'm like, well, how did you clean it? And they're like, well, uh, we don't remember. We got it written down somewhere. And I was like, I haven't posted it yet because I'm still waiting for them to come back and say, here are the steps that we did. Here's what we, you know, here's how we did this. Because I don't think, I think it's somewhat disingenuous to post stuff that you can't sort of audit the whole, the whole chain of. So you have like two versions? I just haven't put it up. Yeah. And the clean ones are very well marked with an explanation of how they got there. So that if you don't agree with how they got into this clean format, you can go back and take the hairy one and you can, then you can come back in three months and say, hey, Nick, you're an idiot. You should be posting the data in this format. And then that's, that hasn't happened yet. That's a discussion I'm waiting to have with someone, which might happen. So. There was a question on the other side. Yeah, a question on the other side? Do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I don't know how to phrase it. It may not be a question, but more of an observation. Uh, but to me, I mean, if, if I had to, I mean, same, I mean, if I had to rank something, I would be, I think I would be far more sort of clear between my ranking sort of at the top and the bottom. Uh, I mean, what I sort of try to indicate with that, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I may have a clear preference for number one, and I definitely like number one over number two. Uh, but the value of the preferences that are further away from sort of the, 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 the what I really prefer, I mean, yeah, come on. I mean, tomorrow I may I may flip them around. Today I flip them this way. Uh, yes, and the I mean, in, in the sort of the preference research or social choice research, is, I mean, do, is, is, do they do something with this? I mean, is, is there sort of a weighted version of so there's, there's There's kind of incomplete models that people will use in sort of these top truncated lists, or you can have kind of equivalence classes between uh, sort of top K items and things like that, um, where you say sort of like, I think the, the reason I brought up the one, the, the bit about how people only rank one element is because Toby asked me a very similar question when I was going through and posting all this data. He said, well, can't you just pick some arbitrary K where everyone's ranked at least K items? Like you're saying, I have a, I have a top couple of items and then the ones below. Well, but if, when you go into the data, it turns out you get a top single, singleton for a lot of, a lot of the data. Yep. And so that you can't sort of just fix this arbitrary well, the top three is probably pretty good, and then that's 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 when you. Why don't you let people do science? Uh, that's what I do. That's why I post all the data. Oh. <laughs> I have one more thing. Uh, so whether it's with movies or with with sweets, I mean, is it possible to derive meta preferences? I mean, the fact that you prefer Reese's over M and M's is maybe because you prefer the combination of chocolate with, I don't know, caramel rather than chocolate and peanuts, or I mean, or with movies, I mean, I, I, it's really that I prefer this producer or this actor or, or, or I mean, something, and therefore I rank the movie high. Yeah, and, and I think that... Of, I mean, yeah, based on sort of these, these generic preferences, can you derive, I don't know, meta preferences or, I mean, I, I think that's 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 a question that sort of is a whole research area in and of itself. Okay. Um, meaning that you know, if you look at some of the recent <laughs> stuff that that sort of Netflix is doing or IMDb is doing, you you have to go into sort of, well, we have these orders. Can we tie these preferences back to? Uh, any kind of meta information that we have. You also have to have the meta information, the metadata, in some way about the alternatives, right? If I have a corpus of 17,000 movies, it's going to take me a while to sort of 
index all the possible different little meta information. And then there's a whole sort of information learning, information theory way you can look at it and say, well, I can include tons of metadata, and of course I'll find one piece of metadata that probably co-varies correctly with all of this and stuff like that. So that's a whole other area of interesting fun. Right. But yeah. I think it's also related um, to combinatorial voting. Yeah. If the, something is an aggregation of different factors, then yeah. it's basically combinatorial voting. Yeah. Yeah. Patrick? Uh, yeah, so uh, it's just more of a, a comment, I guess, than a question. Uh, so, I, I, and I think maybe this comment was already made on the other side, I didn't quite hear it, but from your answer, it seems like it. Uh, so uh, you have this, uh, you made the point that it's important to sort of um, keep the origin of the data, keep the context of it when you collect it, what, what assumptions make sense in the context that it comes from and so on. So I just wanted to mention, I've heard actually people from machine learning say that their use of this repository exactly does the opposite. It sort of, it, it causes people to forget the origin of the data and certain sort of common misinterpretations of the set arise and they get sort of propagated and become the standard interpretation of the data. And to some extent, you could say that a similar thing has happened with the, uh, the planning uh, competition set of benchmarks, although that, that's kind of different because that wasn't really based on much real, anything real in the first <laughs> place. <laughs> At least most of them weren't. Uh, but with the few, the few that did come from sort of a, a real application problem in the background, um, they were usually simplified in some way and then people tend to forget what simplifications were made in the process right. of encoding it. So there seems to, I mean, Obviously, you, you had the ambition to sort of counter this phenomenon, but there seems to be a, um, a phenomenon where gathering these repositories of test cases or data or problems causes some of that process of formulating the problem or collecting the data to be forgotten or disappear from the, uh, the minds of the people who use it in the end. Yeah. So okay. Just a comment. It's been observed. Yeah. It's, yeah, that's that's one of the things that I've, I've heard that quite a bit. And so at least to me, like, I, I, I've been trying to combat that, but I think I think you're right insofar as that it might be something that's not even compatible. Just by by virtue of doing it, like if putting it all in one place, you're sort of encouraging this. I don't know. We'll see. We'll come back next year and see uh, how, how bad it's gotten, right? And we'll just keep looking at it. <laughs> I think yeah, thanks, Mark. No problem. The, the problem is when it's been going for 10 years. Right, but by then I'll be somewhere else and then I won't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. All right. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.